The Aston Martin Valkyrie is one of the most eagerly anticipated road cars ever. Designed by F1 genius Adrian Newey, it promises to be extraordinary. But so far, hard facts have been a bit thin on the ground. Now, however, we're here at Cosworth to see and hear for the first time one of the most crucial parts of the Valkyrie, its engine. So here it is in all its glory. Six and a half litres, a thousand brake horsepower at ten and a half thousand RPM, a naturally aspirated V12. But as exciting as those numbers are, and as beautiful as it is to look at, static, sleeping, that's not what we want. We want to hear what it sounds like. So here it is. Pretty extraordinary, I think you'll agree. Fairly obviously from this unfiltered buzzsaw yowl, revving over 2000 RPM higher than a Ferrari 812 Superfast, this is no normal road engine. It's not even a normal supercar engine, whatever that might be. So to get all the details about how this completely brand new V12 has been designed, we spoke to Bruce Wood, the managing director of Cosworth. Let's start off the fact this didn't actually start as a V12, because the first ones you tested were three-cylinder, is that right? That's right, absolutely. We know that to go from a blank screen to having the first running engine was going to be of the order of 12 or 13 months. And because of the sort of conflict of needing to meet emissions and needing to deliver such a high power per litre, we knew there was a very big challenge there. What we did not want to do is wait 13 months to prove to ourselves that we had met that challenge. So we took a four-cylinder engine that we already had, and we designed and manufactured a three-cylinder cylinder head for that, which was an absolute replica of three cylinders of the Valkyrie design. And we were able to get that up and running within about five months. So from the start of the program, we had a three-cylinder engine, which was an absolute quarter of the Valkyrie. Because we have four catalysts, so each catalyst serves three cylinders, so by running a three-cylinder engine, we were able to replicate every part of a genuine quarter of the finished article. So say within about five or six months of, of starting the program, we were able to say, yes, we're going to be able to deliver emissions and performance. So that three-cylinder delivered both, both 250 horsepower and an emissions pass effectively. So that gave us a little bit of breathing space for the next seven months, knowing that we weren't have to going to go back to the drawing board and fundamentally go back through all of our combustion simulation again. Now, I believe sort of, we'll get onto the carbon fibre on top in a minute and stuff, but actually you were saying that this is possibly the most complicated part of the whole engine. Yes, because the engine is, is unique in the vehicle in being it, it's the only road car in the world with a fully structural engine. So by fully structural, it, it's motor racing Formula One experience. So, so basically, literally if you, you took this out, then yeah, the, exactly. The you take the, the engine out the and there's nothing joining so. the, it just flops down on the road. There's yeah. nothing joining the front <laughs> and rear if you take the engine out. So very unusually, not only does the engine structure and architecture have to sustain the internal loads generated by 12 explosions inside, <laughs> but it has to take all of the vehicle loads in a vehicle like this, with, uh, with Adrian Newey at the helm, then aerodynamic loads were always going to be enormous. And so the aero loads, if you imagine, are trying to, to break the engine out of the car. So they're putting these top mounts in, in compression, the bottom mounts in tension. The gearbox bolts rigidly onto the back of the engine. All of the suspension loads go into the gearbox, go into the engine. So all of the cornering loads are trying to twist the engine off the back of the car. It's a V12, so it's pretty long. So you've got to take all of those loads from here into here, and that was a really hard job. The stiff part of the engine is always from the, the top of the cylinder head downwards, because you've got quite a considerable sort of architecture in the cylinder head, and then when you get into the V, you've got this kind of torque tube, which is a nice structure for stiffness. But you've got to get those loads from here all the way into that stiff part. And so design of this, this cam cover, which you might think would be a straightforward part in an engine, actually turned out to be a huge task. And it's obviously something, I mean, the DFV, all those years ago. Is yeah, the DFV was. pioneered that, that methodology of, of the engine being the structural part of the car. But you said before that they obviously, that they're all single-seaters. 
and this that, is this that is a complicated it enormously because I say we're we're very familiar with with how to make a, a single stud or a four stud structure work in a in a race car. But yeah, normally you're just trying to span one pair of of fairly narrower shoulders than mine. You know, in a four seater you're trying to span two occupants, and so these engine mounts, which have to align with the stiff part of the tub, so the engine mounts have to be fairly closely aligned with the edges of the tub. So that pushes these mounts way out from, from the stiff part of the engine. I'll say that, that was quite a challenge. And you're saying there are other things you had to work around, so there's some machining on the parts here. Every part of the, the engine bay, if you like, is filled with a lot more than just the engine. <laughs> so as you say, there's some proof machining there because the radiators come up here and, and actually overlap a lot of the cylinder head architecture here. Amazingly, the torsion bar springs actually come up here and, and run along this part of the center V and extend right up to about here. Every element of the packaging, super tight. Again, sort of right down under here, diffusers are enormous. The diffusers come right up here and tuck right in close. These are the scavenge pumps for the dry sump. 12 bays are scavenged, front covers scavenged, rear covers scavenged, cylinder heads are scavenged. You need a lot of scavenge pumps, but again, they have to be tucked right in close right down as far as you can. So kind of every part of the engine bay is, is occupied by something and not always engine. <laughs> and there's something sort of missing from the front here that you might normally expect to find. You move around to the back, which I gather um, Adrian Newey wasn't entirely happy about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, this, so the engine revs to um, so say just over 11. That determined that we needed a gear drive for the cams. So to make a chain drive work at that speed, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it, it's, it's, yes, it would be highly risky, yes. Um, a gear drive is a better solution. And, and all race engines are gear drives. So we're very familiar with that. But as the engine goes through, you know, speed range from idle up to 11,000 plus, it goes through many different resonances. And so across the, the backlash of the gears, the gears are always rattling across those backlashes. And that creates noise, creates um, an element of vibration. Normally, you would choose to have the drives on the front of the engine because that gives you a fractionally shorter and a fractionally lighter engine. So that's the starting point. Going back to what we were saying earlier about this being a structural element of the car, these four points are bolted rigidly into the back of the tub. Well, the back of the tub, imagine it's like a sort of skin of a drum. You know, it's a large diaphragm. By having the gear drive at the front here, all of that noise of, of rattling across the backlashes would have transmitted in the tub. We did a lot of work with Southampton University noise studies, and there was no question that putting the gears at the back was better for NVH. You have this full length of the engine in which to dissipate some of that. But it was certainly quite a debate with Adrian as to the fact that it would be slightly longer and slightly heavier. And one of the stories I particularly like about it, I mean, it is beautiful up here, as you said, it, it has to be a beautiful yeah, engine. It can't, yeah, can't yeah. just be effective. It's got to be lovely when you do eventually see it underneath the skin. But as lovely as this is, Adrian Newey wasn't entirely happy with the way that this, this looked. Explain. Well, certainly when, uh, when we first uh, discussed this, uh, Adrian was slightly alarmed by the, the, uh, the high polish finish. And his first question was, how much does that lacquer weigh? From memory, the lacquer weighed something like 80 grams. And that was 80 grams too much. So it's now going to be an option in the car. You can have your fully lacquered plenum, but you can have the option of a non-lacquered plenum to take the weight out. And that, that's been the beauty of the whole thing. Adrian had a very purity of vision from the beginning, and, and that's infectious. That purity of vision is what's driven the whole thing to be what it is. I think we talked earlier about the kind of the weight of the engine. The weight target was hugely ambitious. So was, um, the target was 200, target kilograms. Was 200 kilograms. And we've ended up a couple of kilograms over that. But by setting that 200 kilograms, you know, if we had have said 210, which would have been a lot easier, we would have been at 210. By setting 200, you know, we've ended up at, at just a couple of kilos over than that and, and that's that's how the whole program has worked we've set targets which are a little bit beyond what we think we can actually deliver and i say it's that it's that target setting and that kind of purity of purpose that it will go down in history as one of the great iconic uh, engines and cars but this is obviously not it's not just a, a pretty piece on sitting on top so the plenum uh, obviously has to contain all of the, the sort of dynamic movements from the pressure wave up and down the plenum so if you imagine you've got 12 trumpets in there sucking air one fraction of a second, and then with a the valve overlap, you've got a pressure wave coming back up that trumpet. So with the 12 cylinders, you end up with a very high amplitude pressure wave moving up and down the plenum. And it's important to synchronize a pressure wave moving towards a trumpet at the time the trumpet is breathing in, rather than the time it's breathing out. So there's a lot of engineering going into the shape, and the interior shape particularly, to get the pressure wave in the right place during the right cycle. But then also the loads on the plenum. You know, it's, it's not just a, a thin it's not just a thin shell containing, containing air. You know, this is, 
several skins of carbon. The construction is, is, is really just like a race car tub, so it's several skins of carbon and then aluminium honeycomb and then more skins of carbon on the inside because it's a considerable peak pressures having to be contained within that um, structure. Talking about sort of what materials are we looking at here in terms of sort of the engine as a, as a whole? We sort of purposely didn't choose anything, if you like, space age that, that doesn't have that, that data in place yet for how will that material be behaving in 50 years time. So we've relatively conventional materials, but kind of at the cutting edge of those materials. So the cylinder head, for example, cast aluminium alloy, but it uses an aerospace alloy, which has a fatigue life better than a conventional casting alloy. But it's an alloy that isn't even used typically in motorsport. It's very hard to cast. It's very expensive. This is one of the few engines in the world where you could um, you could sensibly use it. And then internally, presumably, there's still titanium and that sort of thing. Yes, it, it's, the... it's titanium rods and titanium valves. In the motor racing world, for an engine delivering these sort of performance figures, you would use leaded bearings. But of course, in the road-going automotive space, you're not allowed to use leaded bearing shells. So we have um, bearing shells with a polymer overlay, which again. That's at the very cutting edge of what polymer overlay bearings can do because the load is too high for a conventional aluminium bearing. So we've gone for the polymer overlay bearings. And that, I suppose, brings us on to the, the testing. We're, we're standing here. I suppose you should say where we are yes. standing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so we're in one of uh, test three cell test nine. cells, <laughs> test cell nine, that, that we've used for this program. We, we've been running for about a year and we've been running on three cells. One of them has been doing calibration for the emissions calibration. One's been doing performance development and the other's been doing durability running. So kind of setting out into this program, it, it's absolutely a flagship car for Aston Martin. It's, it's not a track day special. And so every part of that has to be a proper, for want of a better description, road car. You have to be able to get in it and punch the button and drive it to the shops if you want to. You have to be able to get in it and drive to Monaco if you want to. So it had to be tested in that proper, if you like, real world durability. And the target we set ourselves was 100,000 kilometers. Because you've got to prove that. And, and this is where we prove it on the dyno cells. So the endurance test for the engine is 220 hours, and that 220 hours, we've done lots of simulation to say that the, the duty cycle in the 220 hours simulates 100,000 kilometers of probable real-world road use. The durability testing is partly Silverstone laps, partly Nürburgring laps, um, partly uh, very high-duty road testing, but then also sitting on the motorway at 70 miles an hour, because actually... That's where resonances exactly, come Exactly, we were in, talking earlier about the resonances that go through the gear train. You can't, uh, you can't push all of those resonances outside of the, the rev range. You have to make sure they're therefore in a part of the rev range where you're not going to be sitting continuously. Yes, we've had one engine that's that gone that through that, engine. that full test and that was the second one. And, and, and we just hear it running for 20 or 30 seconds to think that it's done 220 hours of that. That's <laughs> it's extraordinary. Because <laughs> uh, we're looking at piston speeds of... Piston speeds are about 25, 26 metres per second, which is, is up sort of up with Formula One speeds. And in terms of usability as well, you were saying um, the clutch is obviously, your, I know your, you, you end sort yes. of at the end of the engine, but at the flywheel as well. But yeah, I, I think, as I say, it's got to be everyday usable. And, and, you know, if you're sitting in traffic, there's, and, and I'm sure we've all seen it and you've probably experienced it in some supercars, but, uh, you know, you, you can end up in that sort of kangaroo hopping. Because a, a carbon clutch would obviously be the easiest solution, but... Exactly, so we've actively shied away from that and so it's very important to have the smallest, lightest clutch we could and the lowest inertia because that's very important for the crank dynamics. Obvious solution would be a carbon carbon clutch. Carbon carbon clutches are notoriously sort of light switch on and off. And again, it was very important that that didn't happen, that, that you could actually sit in traffic and you could pull away cleanly. So we ended up using a sintered clutch, which I say has been a more painful engineering solution because it's slightly bigger and higher inertia, but it will give a better driving experience. And we should obviously say that this is part of a hybrid system where you see where various bits are going to be attached to this. Yes. So eventually we'll get to the, the details of that next year. The hybrid part of it was an integral part of the, the design from the beginning. Electric motors, of course, are, are fantastic devices because they're full torque from, from stationary, basically. And so certainly the way the vehicle drives, the way it pulls away, is dramatically assisted by the electrification element. Because so you have an internal combustion engine going from 1,000 RPM to, to 11,000 RPM, huge rev range spread. And so the, the electrification element is, is critically important in the way the vehicle is going to drive and the way it's going to feel. Thank you so much. That has been Pleasure. Pleasure. fantastic getting all Turn. the details of this. I can't wait to hear it out on the road. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, it's, <laughs> going to be, uh, it's going to be a thrill to see it and hear it uh, on the road. Brilliant. Thank Pleasure. you. So there we are, the incredible, the beautiful V12 
for the Valkyrie. All those numbers, all those details, they're just so, so cool. But the one thing that's really gonna live with me is the sound, hearing it on that dyno. Those cells are meant to be soundproof. Only things like F1 engines or World Superbike engines can be heard out with them. And that, that engine, revving to 11,000 RPM. We're gonna find out all sorts of other technical details over the next sort of weeks, months. The aero, the suspension, the hybrid system. But for now, what I'm really pleased about is that that engine, the heart of the car, passes the crucial test makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. If you'd like to see a film on Aston's current V12 flagship, the DBS, then just click on the link to the left. And if you're keen to keep up to date with all future Valkyrie developments, just hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much.